Hello, everyone, and welcome to this EMAS Interactive Roundtable. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Fatih Durmuşoğlu. Uh, I am OBGYN specialist and interested in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Uh, also, uh, I am running the general secretary of EMAS organization right now. Uh, before we begin, I, we would like to thank Abbott for their support and for making this new webinar series possible. Thank you very much for Abbott. Uh, the program and the content are solely the responsibility of EMAS, the European Menopause and Andropause Society. Moving on to technical issues, you have entered this webinar into listen-only mode. Listen-only mode. That simply means that your microphone is muted, so we don't pick up any noise from your end. We do welcome and encourage you to submit your test questions via the Q&A widget located in your Zoom panel. You can enter your questions at any time and we will read them during the presentations. Additionally, this event will be simultaneously translated and you can choose one of the following languages, Russian, Mandarin, Spanish, or Portuguese. You may select language by clicking on the interpretation widget you will find in your Zoom panel. Finally, I remind, remind you that we are recording today's webinar and it will be accessible on the EMAS website. So after this uh, explanations, uh, I would like to uh, start the the webinar, uh, our first speaker will be Professor Tommaso Simacini from Italy, and he is going to speak about effect on glucose metabolism. Sir, you have the screen right now. Please, you can start. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Fatih, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thanks to Imas uh, for the invitation and to Abbott as well uh, for supporting this very uh, interesting program. So we have uh, uh, quite uh, uh, sharp times and we want to keep time for discussion. So let me start right away. Uh, we are discussing uh, uh, what a hormone therapy for menopausal women can do in different areas. And my topic is glucose metabolism. Uh, so let me start by saying that uh, it's, it's well known that at the time of menopause, there is a metabolic change which leads uh, to increased visceral adiposity, increased waist circumference, and this has an impact uh, on metabolism. So this is how women change across the menopausal transition, being thinner before menopause and, and becoming a little bit more like us male, uh, uh, tending to accumulate fat in the abdomen uh, after menopause. Now this change has uh, multiple reasons, uh, but, uh, and, and I won't go into the pathophysiology of why this happens because this is very complex, uh, but the, uh, uh, this change leads to an increase in body weight and central adiposity. Uh, it needs uh, to be uh, approached with the severe diet and lifestyle advices in those person where this is more severe and because it brings metabolic alterations like insulin resistance, lipid metabolic disorders, and uh, in the end, increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So uh, the topic is uh, uh, menopausal hormone therapy. Uh, what does it do on glucose metabolism? Um, and I will try to touch on uh, uh, some of the points uh, that you see on, on these slides during my presentation. So first of all, um, it has been observed and now measured a little bit more uh, specifically, more objectively in a large court uh, um, uh, in a couple of years ago, uh, the Osteolaus court, that those women who use menopausal hormone therapy across 
across the menopausal transition and throughout uh, the aging process uh, uh, have uh, um, less accumulation of fat and particularly less accumulation of visceral fat. So in these graphs, you see those white graphs um, are uh, depict the behavior, the fat accumulation um, by current users of MHT, the light gray, the past users, uh, and the darker gray, the never users. So the never users accumulate much more fat in the abdomen than uh, users of HRT. And in this same study, one can see that uh, the amount of glucose uh, in the bloodstream is not that different uh, in this population. But in current users, which is uh, the uh, third right column, uh, the amount of insulin circulating in fasting condition is much lower than in non-users. So these women seem to be more insulin sensitive and the HOMA index uh, uh, is, is better than the non-users, confirming the, the, the relevant impact of HRT or menopausal hormone therapy on insulin uh, uh, biology and metabolism. There's a, there's a quite dated meta-analysis, but it's still the, uh, cited a lot by, by Sally Salpeter and, uh, and the group, a new group. It's a big meta-analysis uh, published in 2006 uh, that reports on more than 100 uh, prospective uh, studies uh, that discuss the effect of uh, menopausal hormone therapy on diabetes. And what it comes uh, from these very solid studies is that in women without diabetes, MHT decreases uh, a lot of things, including abdominal obesity, insulin resistance, but mostly new onset diabetes. And in women with diabetes, MHT decreases insulin resistance and fasting glucose. So it doesn't have any bad effect on the control uh, in women that need the therapy for diabetes. This is the PEPI trial, one of the oldest uh, uh, observational trials that we have uh, available, uh, published in, uh, in the, the mid 90s of uh, the last century, as, uh, as we say depicting again in this large population observed for many years, uh, how insulin levels in those women who use uh, estrogens uh, are better, lower than in those women that do not use estrogens. In a different graphical form, you can also see that, however, uh, menopausal hormone therapy may have different impacts on glucose metabolism, and particularly in this case on non-fasting blood sugar levels, uh, based on the presence or absence of a progestin. You do see that those women who use, uh, in a paper trial, conjugated equine estrogens uh, have lower uh, blood sugar levels uh, than those women who use contemporarily conjugated equine estrogens and medroxyprogesterone acetate. And however, if you use a micronized progesterone, this effect is blunted. So this is one of the first suggestions in our uh, recent history in clinical trials, suggesting that progestins might make a difference also on glucose metabolism. Let's see insulin sensitivity. This is another comparative uh, trial done by the group uh, from John Stevenson, um, published in 2000, where you do see that the same type of estrogen uh, provided with the same progestin, norethisterone acetate, by through different uh, routes, transdermal or oral routes, does make a big difference on insulin sensitivity. With uh, the oral administration be better because uh, the insulin sensitivity is improved, uh, showing that part of the effects of estrogens uh, in terms of glucose and insulin metabolism are mediated by the liver and therefore the, the first uh, uh, passage liver effect uh, might be relevant. So how do estrogens and progesterones work uh, on uh, glucose metabolism? What do we know? So uh, to make a very long story very short, uh, we do know that in the brain, uh, there is uh, a lot of estrogen and progesterone receptor and androgen receptors, but in the hypothalamus particularly, estrogens act through ER alpha to suppress food intake, uh, to stimulate physical activity and energy expenditure, which of course is extremely important in terms of keeping uh, the body shape and uh, the amount of fat and not making it improve. And again, so there was a lot of uh, pathways that have been identified. This is a, a paper published by uh, Francois Mauvais-Jarp, a big expert in diabetes and, and estrogens, uh, that show that how estrogen can improve peripheral energy and glucose homeostasis. I'm not going through all the points. Uh, you can look at them on the slide. But overall, 
there is a multiple amount of mechanisms through which estrogens and their receptors act. Both the estrogen receptor alpha, and as you can see in this slide, estrogen receptor beta, how they do activate peripheral energy expenditure, which is uh, of course very important for um, weight gain, uh, fat accumulation, and uh, of course, uh, glucose metabolism. Um, and the, the data that we have, this is another very large uh, uh, paper, big paper published very recently in the Diabetes and Metabolism Journal, um, shows showing that uh, in a big cohort of women, uh, there's uh, insulin sensitizing properties of uh, estrogens uh, provided as menopausal hormone therapy and uh, um, it effects of estrogens on insulin mediated glucose uptake signaling and glucose transport in adipose tissue and muscles, which is very important. So this is the data from the population in, uh, in the study. You do see that these women who were actually diabetics, uh, so this was not healthy women, these were women with type two diabetes mellitus, uh, in, a, in a model assessing insulin resistance, uh, well, the administration of menopausal hormone therapy decreased by 36% insulin resistance, supporting those data that we saw before uh, from the meta-analysis from uh, Sally Salpito. Um, so when we discuss about progestogens, however, this, the, the, the story becomes much more complex. We have so many progestins and only a few estrogens. Uh, estrogens have been much more studied to this uh, extent. But progestogens as a family, as a whole, have been associated with insulin resistance. So they, they look like the, the bad brother as compared to estrogens. However, there's a lot of differences based on the progestogen type. And you all know how many families of progestins we have and the, the, the chemical moieties are very different. Uh, different, uh, And this makes a difference in cells uh, because uh, these different compounds uh, can uh, bind uh, to progesterone receptors in different ways uh, and to non-progesterone receptors uh, like androgen receptor, glucocorticoid, or mineralocorticoid receptors uh, and providing multiple signaling effects in cells. So each progestin has a very specific, peculiar way of uh, modifying the metabolism in cells. So if one wants to make a very long story short, uh, what we know about progestogens on glucose homeostasis is that oral androgenic progestogens uh, tend to increase insulin resistance. Transdermal norethisterone acetate, as you know, it's the only transdermal progestin available, has little effects on insulin. And this is, of course, uh, need to be taken into account that it also uh, goes along with the transdermal estrogen administration. MPA, medroxyprogesterone acetate, as we have seen in the PEPI trial before, has adverse effects on glucose and insulin, possibly also because of its glucocorticoid effect. Progesterone, natural progesterone, or molecules that are similar to progesterone, like didrogesterone, indeed tend to have little adverse effects or no adverse effects on glucose and insulin. And I'd like to show you here a couple of studies, again, one from John Stevenson, showing that women receiving uh, uh, a combination of estradiol and didrogesterone tend to have uh, over two years uh, progressively improving amounts of insulin and slightly uh, also of, of sick peptide showing improved uh, insulin sensitivity. And again, in this uh, second study by Gotsland, uh, uh, once again, uh, uh, a court with a low dose uh, sequential estradiol didrogesterone combination showing again, stable fasting glucose levels, but decreasing fasting insulin levels, uh, suggesting improved uh, insulin sensitivity in these women. So therefore, the uh, uh, big take home message is that uh, when, when one wants to discuss about the effects of uh, menopausal hormone therapy on glucose metabolism, one needs to discuss about the right of, uh, route of administration, the type of combination, which progestin, which estrogen, the dose, uh, because they all impact metabolic outcomes. And my concluding slide is that uh, uh, overall menopause tends to have a worsening effect on glucose and insulin metabolism. It, uh, menopausal hormone, ther hormone therapy has no detrimental effects on glucose and insulin metabolism in general. And it seems in the big numbers to prevent fat deposition and the risk of developing type two diabetes. Now there are significant differences uh, related to the effects of glucose and insulin metabolism based on the type, those, a route of administration, as we have said, but the type of progestin is also one critical aspect with androgenic progestins being associated with adverse actions 
on glucose and insulin, while progesterone and diprogesterone seem to be neutral or beneficial, as we have seen in these two uh, last uh, two studies that I showed. So therefore, an appropriate MHT could lead to metabolic benefits in postmenopausal women, also in terms of glucose metabolism. I'd like to thank you, and uh, if there's any question, I'd be very glad uh, to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. So it, 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 it is a great presentation. We are going to take the uh, questions at the end of the uh, presentations. So I would like to pass to the second topic uh, by Dr. Panagitos uh, Anaktastis, effect on lipid metabolism. Uh, please, sir, take the stage. Uh, it's your turn. Just a minute, share my screen. I hope it is clear to see. Okay. Uh, dear, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizing committee for this session, for this formal invitation. Uh, in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes, we will discuss about the effect of uh, menopausal hormone therapy on uh, lipid uh, metabolism. There is no conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, the, the outline of my presentation actually focuses on, on three topics. The first, we will discuss about uh, the, metabolic, the metabolic changes during transition to menopause. Second, and uh, most important, we will discuss about the effect of menopausal hormone therapy on the lipid profile. And finally, we will give a, a kind of a guidance, a kind of a clinical approach to the, to the postmenopausal woman with uh, dyslipidemia. <clears throat> With regard to the first topic, uh, it is well known that the transition to menopause is associated with an increased atherosclerotic risk profile. This is uh, mainly attributed to uh, uh, this lipidemic uh, lipid, uh, pro profile converging that uh, seen in men, uh, which includes uh, mainly the increase in total and LDL cholesterol, as well as triglyceride levels, converging and sometimes exceeding uh, those seen in men. There is also a decrease in high-density lipoprotein cholesterol involving uh, mainly uh, the uh, HDL2 subfraction. <clears throat> uh, there are also some other uh, lipid changes that involve uh, the, the increase in apolipoprotein uh, beta, as well as the ratio uh, ApoB to ApoE1 and uh, LDL cholesterol to ApoB. And there is a, a slight or a neutral uh, effect of menopause on uh, lipoprotein little a concentrations. Uh, we, we must uh, remind that uh, uh, lipoprotein little a has been recently uh, recognized as an independent uh, atherosclerotic uh, risk factor. Uh, there are also some other uh, metabolic changes uh, that were also mentioned by the previous uh, presenter, such as the increase in uh, abdominal fat, uh, the increase in insulin resistance and uh, blood pressure, and uh, 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 last but not least, uh, uh, the, the uh, increased prevalence of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. All these converge to an increased uh, uh, atherosclerotic risk seen uh, uh, while uh, women enter menopause. However, this has not been uh, translated into an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease events, uh, uh, which has been shown in women with premature menopause uh, and uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. That means that it is not currently known if uh, uh, these uh, uh, this lipidemia uh, and the other uh, atherosclerotic risk factors uh, or, uh, associated with uh, menopausal transition uh, are also translated into an increased risk in, in cardiovascular disease uh, events. With regard to the second topic, uh, we will focus on that. Uh, estrogens uh, are the uh, main uh, component of uh, menopausal hormone therapy and the estrogen uh, either as oral or uh, either or, uh, as uh, transdermal uh, preparation exert a favorable effect on lipid profile. This includes a, a, a decrease in total and LDL cholesterol, as well as an increase in HDL cholesterol. Uh, we must mention that uh, it has to do with a kind of dose-dependent effect. It is more pronounced in patients with high baseline total and the LDL cholesterol concentrations. It is greatest with the conjugated econestrogen, and uh, as you can see, uh, it is greatest with oral preparations compared uh, with uh, transdermal. Uh, you, you can see this table uh, according to a, a, a very uh, well-known and thorough systematic review by uh, Professor Gotsland that uh, you can see the uh, mean percentage changes in 
uh, uh, conjugated uh, econestrogen in different doses, conventional and high dose, you can see about a 15% increase in HDL and 18% uh, with the, the highest dose and uh, quite a 12% uh, decrease in LDL, a minor uh, decrease in uh, total cholesterol and uh, an increase in uh, triglyceride levels and we must keep this uh, in mind. Uh, you can also see these changes uh, to a lesser extent with uh, 17 beta uh, estradiol. This is also dose dependent. But what is of uh, utmost importance is that uh, when we use transdermal estradiol, we may see uh, uh, to a lesser extent these uh, favorable changes with regard to HDL and LDL, but we have also a, a decrease in triglyceride levels or either a, a, a neutral effect with higher dose. Uh, this is the uh, usual uh, with the, uh, conventional dose used in menopausal hormone therapy, uh, 50 micrograms uh, per day. Whereas with 100, we have a, a minor uh, or a, a neutral effect on uh, triglycerides. This is very important and must be taken into consideration. The favorable uh, effect has been also seen and uh, proved uh, in uh, another meta-analysis. As you can see here, there is a, a decrease, uh, an, an absolute decrease of uh, 12 milligrams per deciliter in total and uh, LDL cholesterol, while uh, there is no increase in, uh, uh, there's no effect on HDL and uh, triglycerides. Uh, according to a uh, quite a recent uh, meta-analysis that uh, we, which we published in Majoritas uh, in 2017, uh, this uh, uh, highlights the beneficial effect on uh, LPD delay. We, we must uh, keep in mind that, that uh, there is currently no uh, effective medication on uh, LPD delay, except for estrogen. As you can see here, there is uh, about a 20% uh, decrease in uh, uh, LPD delay concentrations, and these are higher uh, with uh, oral Compared, com compared with uh, transdermal uh, preparation. Uh, triglycerides, uh, as uh, uh, I mentioned before, uh, increase with oral, uh, they may either decrease or remain stable with transdermal, whereas uh, LPL delay uh, decreases about 20 to 25% uh, with oral and to a lesser extent with transdermal. Uh, there is no effect of uh, estrogen on uh, apobeta uh, levels and there is a beneficial effect on ApoA1 this is the, the main uh, component, the main apolipoprotein of the good cholesterol, of the HDL cholesterol. Uh, what about uh, progestogens? Uh, uh, in general, there is little effect uh, on, on this uh, beneficial uh, estrogen-related uh, decrease in uh, total and LDL cholesterol. Uh, however, with regard to HDL and uh, triglycerides, uh, norethisterone may decrease uh, HDL and triglycerides, whereas uh, this is neutral uh, concerning uh, micronized progesterone and uh, didrogesterone. Uh, with regard to medroxyprogesterone, this, uh, there is unclear effect on lipids, whereas there is no effect at all uh, for uh, intrauterine uh, levonorgestrel, which is uh, also used. With regard to tibolone, which is also used and uh, exerts uh, both estrogenic, progestogenic and endogenic uh, effects, you can see here the beneficial effect on total cholesterol triglycerides and the LPD delay, but there is also a detrimental effect on uh, HDL cholesterol. And uh, as you can see here, there is a 22% decrease in HDL cholesterol with uh, Tybolon, whereas there is a kind of beneficial effect of uh, uh, total cholesterol and uh, uh, on, on triglycerides. But uh, uh, what is uh, most important is the decrease in lipoprotein uh, LPD delay, which is also dose dependent. Uh, with regard to the uh, combination, as we call it, uh, TSEC, that is conjugated, uh, low dose conjugated estrogen uh, with plazidoxifen, we uh, can uh, see the uh, same effects as with oral estrogens, as I mentioned before, to, uh, to uh, actually a lesser extent. There are actually slight or subtle differences uh, with regard to vaginal estrogen, either as a ring, as a is, uh, estriol, or as, as creams or uh, gels or uh, whatever. You can see uh, a slight uh, decrease in total and LDL as well as apobeta uh, concentrations as with uh, oral estrogen, but there is no effect on HDL and uh, triglycerides. Uh, I must also mention some uh, non estrogen based uh, therapies which are also used in women, such as for those with uh, valvovaginal atrophy. We, we can use ospepifen, it is a well known selective estrogen receptor modulator. Uh, you can see a kind of uh, decrease in total and LDL cholesterol and increase in uh, HDL and no effect on triglycerides. This is also the case uh, with uh, vaginal uh, deidroepiandrosterone, which uh, 
uh, not uh, which is a, a kind of uh, and, uh, androgen with um, uh, uh, not so strong androgenic properties like testosterone, but it can be used for valvovaginal atrophy. There is no effect on LDL and triglycerides. Uh, with regard to testosterone, it is uh, it can be used in women with uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder dysfunction. We do not use oral testosterone. It has uh, actually a negative effect on lipid profile, whereas the non-oral preparations uh, do not have any effect uh, at all. Uh, uh, some doctors uh, use and uh, must use uh, antidepressants, uh, as we know, SSRIs or SNRIs in women with, uh, with uh, contraindications to menopausal hormone therapy. Of all these uh, regimens, uh, fluoxetine and uh, citalopram have the either neutral or less detrimental effect on lipid profile. The other uh, formulations, such as uh, venlafaxine, duloxetine, may either increase total cholesterol or decrease uh, A-state cholesterol. These uh, uh, modifications in uh, lipid profile must also be kept in mind. So, uh, taking all of this data into consideration, uh, the first step is to estimate the, the uh, woman's 10 year risk for fatal cardiovascular disease. This may be assessed uh, with um, some scores. The, uh, one of the most uh, commonly used in the European population is, is that provided by the European uh, uh, Society of Cardiology, uh, the score system. You, you, you can uh, use that and uh, according to the percentage that you, you will uh, find for the, for the uh, woman, this woman can be classified, uh, classified either as very high, as high, moderate or low risk if she has documented uh, arteriosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes with end organ, organ damage or with a score uh, above 10%. Whereas if, she's, uh, uh, with, uh, if she suffers from, from uh, type 2 diabetes uh, with uh, one additional risk factor and uh, if she has, uh, uh, or, or if, if she has a familiar hypercholesterolemia or with moderate chronic kidney disease or with a, a score uh, between 5 and 10%, uh, she will be uh, diagnosed as high uh, cardiovascular uh, risk patient. Whereas for the other patients with a score between 1 and 5%, we have moderate risk and uh, when uh, the calculated score is below 1%, uh, the a woman or, or man actually uh, is uh, categorized as low risk. Uh, this is very important because according to the categorization, uh, the LDL target, which is the most important lipid parameter, is to be below 55, below 70 for high risk, below 100 for moderate risk, and below 160 milligrams per deciliter for low risk. And we should also take into account the other lipid parameters, such as non-HDL, apobeta, triglycerides, and uh, LP litlay, uh, and uh, uh, try to uh, achieve these, uh, these targets as provided by the European Society of Cardiology. And uh, uh, to provide a kind of algorithm uh, after assessing the, the woman's lipid profile and calculating her 10-year uh, uh, risk for cardiovascular disease, for fetal uh, cardiovascular, for fatal, uh, cardiovascular disease, you can see here that if she's uh, at very high or uh, high cardiovascular risk, we uh, should avoid menopausal hormone therapy uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, start a statin uh, either alone or, or with acetamide or with a PCSK9 inhibitor to reach the LDL cholesterol level. In cases uh, with, um, uh, uh, con con with uh, co uh, co existence of uh, triglycerides, of high triglycerides, despite uh, statin, we should add either eicosapentadiene ethyl at four grams per day, kind of omega-3 fatty acid, or a fibrate. If a woman is at moderate cardiovascular risk, uh, we can use uh, menopausal hormone therapy, preferring transdermal route. And of course, if the LDL target uh, has not been achieved, we can use uh, a, a, a statin or azetamide. In cases at low cardiovascular risk, we can take uh, also lipoprotein little a into account if it is high. That means higher than uh, 50 mi uh, milligrams per deciliter. We should consider oral instead of other uh, uh, other preparations. And of course, if we have uh, high triglycerides, as I mentioned before, we should use transdermal route. To conclude, transition to menopause is indeed associated with increased cardiovascular risk. Systemic estrogens induce a kind of dose-dependent decrease in total LDL and LP little a concentrations. They can also increase the uh, HDL concentrations. This effect is more pronounced with oral estrogens, and uh, transdermal uh, is the preferred estrogen because uh, 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 compared with oral, uh, it cannot uh, increase, actually can decrease 
triglyceride levels. With regard to progestogen, we should use a micronized or digestogen because this have a, a neutral effect on lipid profile. We can use tibolone because it may decrease total LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and LDL delay. But we must uh, keep in mind that it can also increase HDL. It can also decrease uh, HDL concentrations. The other preparations have uh, either a uh, subtle effect on lipid profiles, such as uh, low dose vaginal estrogen and oscopifen. With regard to SSRIs, fluoxetine and uh, citalopram, except a more favorable effect, and uh, non-oral testosterone has uh, a little or no effect on lipid profile. We, you can also see these details in our published uh, EMAS uh, guide, published uh, two years ago. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a very useful, uh, fruitful presentation. Uh, we will have some questions, I believe. Uh, now I am going to pass to Dr. Elena Armeni from Greece. Uh, her topic will be effect on atherosclerosis progression. Here you are, Dr. Elena. Thank you, Professor Domusoglu. I will start with sharing my screen. Uh, one more second and we should be ready. Yes, excellent. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Armeni and I am working as a honorary research fellow with the second department of obstetrics and gynecology at Eteon Hospital in Athens, Greece for many years. I have need to thank the organizing committee for this invitation to discuss menopause hormone treatment on atherosclerosis progression with all of you. Now, with regards to the pathophysiology of menopausal hormonal changes, aging and ovarian senescence is associated with a decline, a sharp decline in levels of estrogen and sex hormone binding globulin at the time of menopause. This results into an increase in the androgen to estrogen ratio. The environment of apparent androgenicity is associated with four different implications, metabolic, and hormonal, impaired fibrinolysis, visceral adiposity, as previously mentioned, insulin resistance, and the hyperandrogenemia by itself. Impaired fibrinolysis has been associated with the early stages of atherosclerosis, which actually implies the thickening of the intima media wall of carotid and coronary arteries. Visceral adiposity in combination with insulin resistance can result into metabolic dysfunction, oxidative stress, and low-grade chronic inflammation, a condition and changes to which hyperandrogenemia has been shown to be an independent direct adverse predictor. All of these changes, together with the early thickening of the intima media thickness, result into the primary pathophysiological change observed in the vessel wall of postmenopausal women, which is the endothelial dysfunction. In vitro data has tried to explore the actual effect of estradiol administration to the vas vessels itself, the vasculature and related pathophysiological changes. More specifically, data in mice has shown that estrogen administration can increase angi angiogenesis, improve vasodilation. With regards to fibrosis, it is known to suppress fibroblast migration and proliferation and also to decrease the collagen deposition. Mitochondria seems to also benefit from an environment rich in estrogen because their survival is improved, apoptosis is reduced, free acid, fatty acid oxidation is increased, improved, and the reactive oxygen species production is also suppressed. These changes contribute to a delay of the atherosclerotic process. An beneficial effect on oxidative stress overall with improved cell survival is also documented. We will move on by studying the effect of menopause itself to atherosclerotic changes so that we can later on explore the possible beneficial effects of hormone replacement therapy. 
a lot of um, cross-sectional studies, which are actually less than five, but still a lot, have tried to explore the changes observed in endothelial function in women approaching the menopause cell transition and also later on. These cross-sectional studies have shown that endothelial function is declining progressively with age since menopause and in parallel with the time since the onset of estrogen deficiency. In a study, longitudinal, that has been performed by a laboratory a few years ago, 180 postmenopausal women were investigated for an average of 29 months. We tried to explore changes in endothelial function over time. The results showed something quite interesting. The slope of the gradient with regards to flow mediated dilation which is a non-invasive marker indicative of changes in endothelial function is always declining with time but the rate of the decline is less steep in women with lower baseline androgen levels as opposed to women with higher baseline androgen levels that means higher androgenicity at the time they entered the menopause Arterial stiffness and the progression at the time of the menopause transition has been investigated by, this, by the study of women's health across the nation in 2020. The study aimed to investigate the percentage change in carotid femoral pulse wave velocity measured by time segments in relation to the final menstrual period. The results of the study are also quite interesting because they showed that arterial stiffness is slowly deteriorating with time up until 12 months before the final menstrual period. The slope of change is becoming more steep, deteriorating more sharply around the perimenopause, so from 12 months before up until 12 months after the final menstrual period and subsequently the pulse wave velocity starts decreasing with time. The same study in another analysis tried to investigate as to whether or not the menopausal transition is associated with changes in vascular structure. In a sample of 249 perimenopausal women followed up for a median of 3.7 years, the authors managed to confirm that the rate of progression in intima media thickness of the carotid artery was higher for women in the late perimenopausal stage as opposed to premenopausal or early perimenopausal women. This rate was also significantly higher compared to women in the postmenopausal stage. Trying to check as to whether or not there is a prediction or so a direct association between the change in IMT values and the stage of reproductive life, they could not find a significant association, but the reason was related with the fact that adjustment did take place for the presence of cardiovascular risk factors. That means that without taking cardiovascular risk into account, in any case, late perimenopausal women do present with a higher progression rate in the thickening of carotid arteries. In another study done by a laboratory, we tried to investigate as to whether or not postmenopausal women without diabetes, but with a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, do have any difference with regards to measures of subclinical atherosclerosis. Interestingly enough, we found difference with regards to common carotid artery thickness and combined carotid artery thickness. Both of them were found to be statistically significant and higher for women with the metabolic syndrome as opposed to those without the metabolic syndrome. Regression analysis confirmed the findings that the thickening of the carotid arteries is associated with features of the metabolic syndrome, like hyperglycemia, central obesity, central obesity or dyslipidemia. So the metabolic syndrome by itself or its independent features does not positively affect subclinical atherosclerosis in menopause. Let's move on to HRT though. Observational studies on menopause hormone treatment and coronary heart disease during the late 1980 until 2000 did confirm positive findings with regards to estrogen use in women with angiographically defined coronary heart disease as opposed to non-users of estrogen, while others did show that menopause hormone therapy use was associated with improved fatal 
events with regards to cardiovascular disease, so lower rates of fatal cardiovascular disease, lower rates of mortality for those on anopause estradiol treatment after the menopause. Therefore, WHI came along. This long-term randomized control trial of 27,347 postmenopausal women tried to clarify as to whether or not the combination of estrogen and progesterone or estrogen monotherapy would have a superior effect with regards to cardiovascular protection or not really. Then, unfortunately, the study, which consisted of an unselected population of older postmenopausal women, was terminated prematurely because of adverse events of breast cancer at the estrogen progesterone arm and stroke risk in the estrogen only arm. The reason has been investigated on multiple times, multiple occasions. And subsequently, the literature concluded on the fact that the difference is primarily related with the fact that women were old many times after the actual menopausal transition when they were started on treatment with menopause hormone therapy. Also, they had different cardiovascular risk considering it was an unselected population. The study presented in 2013 in JAMA showed that the actual absolute benefit with regards, absolute risk, apologies, with regards to coronary heart disease in women treated with estrogen and progesterone, as opposed to estradiol monotherapy, is improved, is beneficial for women started on treatment in the first two decades of the life after ovarian senescence, whilst starting treatment on an, at an older age is not going to be associated with any improved profile with regards to cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular events, coronary heart disease events should be anticipated. The same authors try to analyze the post-intervention risk for coronary heart disease and found that those that, women that were started on treatment at an age of 50 to 59 years did actually have a beneficial profile with only five cases presenting coronary heart disease events as for the, from those that were started on treatment with estrogen and progesterone, as opposed to an actual benefit of 11 cases less that would be anticipated to express coronary heart disease events for those on estrogen monotherapy. The same applies for women on treatment 60 to 69 years. Conclusion from this slide, treatment is beneficial, but the WHI was trying to tell us, try to start treatment earlier rather than later after the menopause. The KEEPS trial came along in order to try to investigate as to whether or not oral versus transdermal menopause hormone therapy is associated with any change in subclinical atherosclerosis as opposed to placebo. The results of the trial showed that the mean difference in the change of carotid intima media thickness was non-significant comparing oral treatment versus placebo and transdermal treatment versus placebo. In very simple words, no adverse effect noted with regards to subclinical atherosclerosis. The same study tried to investigate as to whether or not treatment has an adverse effect with regards to the change in coronary artery calcium, but once again, no significant difference was noted. A little bit later, the ELITE trial tried to assess the hypothesis for which grounds were set by WHI as to whether or not early as opposed to late initiation of treatment would make any difference with regards to subclinical atherosclerosis in healthy postmenopausal women. This trial did manage to show a significant difference, an improved beneficial rate in the change of carotid intima media thickness for those on treatment with estradiol as opposed to placebo. Early initiators were the one women that had a menopausal age until six years. Late initiators, more than 10 years. The difference in the slope is quite obvious. The red dots indicate early postmenopause on placebo. The blue dots indicate early postmenopausal women on estradiol. This study set the grounds for the timing hypothesis. The timing hypothesis is a hypothesis that was tried to be investigated by many authors, but the investigations and the studies on this aspect are still ongoing. 
Timing hypothesis means what is the window of opportunity to give HRT in a postmenopausal woman with regards to improving the cardiovascular risk. So this meta-regression analysis of 31 randomized controlled trials and 40,521 women showed that early initiation of HRT did actually protect from all-cause mortality. Early initiation of HRT was not significantly associated with cardiac mortality or all coronary events. And there was a slightly increased risk with regards to thrombosis in early as opposed to late initiators of treatment. But the profile and the overall risk was lower for those starting treatment earlier as opposed to those starting treatment later in life. One more analysis from WHI is trying to represent the absolute risk amongst women on conventional dose of menopause hormone therapy, stratified according to the age of menopause and the risk of presenting with different variations of cardiovascular disease. This analysis does confirm the previous hypothesis that women of the green bar, less than five years in menopause, have the best profile, while those that were started on treatment after 20 years into the menopause have the highest risk. Coming to the end, a very recent and interesting study was published in May 2021, representing once again a reanalysis of the WHI. This study tried to estimate predictors of cardiovascular risk considering the actual cardiovascular risk as a possible reason for the different expression, the different outcomes with regards to the women, those women that were treated with menopause hormone therapy. The study managed to show that age, as expected, is a risk factor for cardiovascular risk. Yes, in, since menopause is one more, but the strongest of them all is the baseline cardiovascular disease risk at the time of actually transitioning into the menopause. The study showed that women with a higher calculated cardiovascular disease score at the time of entering the menopause have the highest risk for incident cardiovascular disease events as opposed to those with a better metabolic profile at the time of entering the menopause. Thank you very much and don't forget to assess your cardiovascular risk when prescribing hormone replacement therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. It's a very important uh, lecture for women health, as well as the others now. Uh, in a fast way, I would like to pass to discussion, questions and answers. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I would like to start with the question and answer part icon. Uh, we have a question like oral estrogens. Uh, actually, this question is going to be for Dr. Uh, Panagiotis. I think he is there. I don't know whether he can read this. Yes. Oral estrogens increase high density lipoproteins by activating hepatic lipoprotein lipase, but transdermal estrogens activate peripheral lipoprotein lipase and decrease high density lipoproteins. Can you comment on this? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question. Actually, uh, I don't agree that uh, transdermal estrogen decreases HDL. Uh, both oral and transdermal estrogen increase HDL cholesterol. The, the mechanisms are not so, so clear but uh, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, it has to do with a kind of effect on the APOA1 gene. Uh, oral estrogen may increase uh, to a, a, a higher extent the uh, production of APOA1, which is the, the main component of HDL cholesterol, of the HDL particle. Uh, there is also a, a difference in the production of the, of the uh, uh, he hepatic uh, influx of uh, uh, free, free fatty acids, which leads to uh, greater production in VLDL uh, lipoproteins. So I, I think that uh, the, the mechanisms are more, more complex, but uh, to give a, a clear message, both oral and transdermal estrogen increase HDL cholesterol, but oral to uh, a, a greater extent, 
but uh, they also uh, increase triglycerides, whereas transdermal do not. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is an answer uh, or question again from the same person. It is all about LDL, not HDL particles, he says. To you, uh, Dr. Panagiotis. Uh, so it is, it is all about uh, uh, I LDL, remember. not uh, HDL particles. Ah, it, it was about uh, LDL. Uh, again, uh, I think uh, it has to do with uh, the effect on the uh, apobita gene uh, because uh, uh, apobita uh, is the, the, the main and uh, most atherogenic uh, apolipoprotein and uh, uh, both uh, uh, transdermal and oral uh, estrogens, as I mentioned, uh, decrease uh, LDL cholesterol. This is greater with oral. But we must keep in mind that uh, we, we can also see uh, a, a decrease with transdermal uh, estrogen. So it has not uh, to do with lipoprotein lipase. Uh, thank you. There is an, another connected question related with this. I think you are going to answer this also. In your opinion, what is more important in terms of beneficial effects on lipids? Mm -hmm. including triglycerides, the route of administration, or the daily dose and type of estrogens, or both? Yes, it is not, as we say, one size fits all. Uh, that, that means uh, we cannot select uh, one risk factor, one uh, component of the metabolic profile to, uh, to base our menopausal hormone therapy. We must uh, uh, calculate the uh, whole cardiovascular risk in our patient. Uh, for example, if uh, the patient is obese and uh, if she has, is uh, at a, a high throm thrombolic risk, uh, we should uh, take into account the uh, detrimental effect of oral estrogens on, on this regard. So we, we can choose a transdermal. It uh, depends uh, on, the, on the age of the patient. Uh, that means if we have a patient uh, at the age of 40 to 45, that means she's uh, at the age of, of uh, uh, premature uh, menopause or, or premature ovarian sufficiency, we should use uh, the highest dose, that is 100 uh, micrograms uh, of transdermal estrogen. Um, and uh, of course, we should also take into account the response to the progestogen uh, effect. So it's a, a quite complex uh, question with a, a complex answer. The, 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 most simple, the uh, simplest way to, to answer this is to uh, say that we should uh, individualize our approach to the patient and uh, take into account the effect of each uh, component of the menopausal hormone therapy on each uh, component of the metabolic uh, risk profile of the patient. Th thank you very much, Panagiotis. Uh, I welcome. think this question is for you, Tommaso, uh, Dr. Tommaso. Is there any study? Is there any study what happens to metabolic profile once menopausal hormone therapy is complete? After finishing, uh, well, uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Fatih, for for uh, passing this question. This is an interesting one. We do know that uh, in uh, particularly in the long term uh, observation of the WHI, the advantages uh, on cardiovascular disease uh, is maintained over a long time. Uh, the same uh, we know that happens mm -hmm. on osteoporosis and uh, the risk of fractures. So when people stop. Uh, uh, menopausal hormone therapy, they keep an advantage. In terms of keeping metabolic advantages, uh, so uh, improved insulin sensitivity, lower glucose levels, or, or even uh, better lipid profile, we do know that this uh, stops immediately once you stop the administration because these effects uh, are provided by the current uh, um, interference of estrogens and progestogens uh, with the metabolism of that uh, person. So the, the, the metabolic markers uh, revert to, back, to baseline once one stops, uh, but the advantages may be uh, long lasting. Thank you very much uh, for your nice answer. Uh, I don't know uh, to whom I am going to direct this question, the question is, is there a reason to limit uh, menopausal hormone treatment duration to three, five, 
10 years or at all. Uh, would you like to comment on this, uh, Tommaso, uh, about the duration? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. There, there is actually no reason uh, to uh, set a, a limitation. Uh, so the, 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 and, and it's actually in no guidelines uh, indicate uh, a limit uh, for duration of menopausal hormone therapy um, uh, in, any, in any country you go to. So uh, the driving uh, uh, force should be the indication. If a woman has a reason to stay on MHT for a time that is longer than five years or, or even forever, there's really no reason why to stop it. Um, many, most women, I would say, after several years, uh, stop to have a, a real reason to use uh, uh, MHT. They don't have as a motor symptoms. Uh, they have good bones, so protection of bones is not longer any longer necessary. So in these persons, I think it's very reasonable to stop. But there's also women that uh, stay and, and keep on with having vasomotor symptoms for 20 to 25 years. So if these women need uh, MHT, it's absolutely fine to continue to, to use MHT in these women. Thank you very much. I have a, a, another interesting question over here. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to take each of your comment on this uh, about estedrol E4. Thank you uh, very much for this interesting presentation. Are there any metabolic advantages of estedrol compared to E2? Uh, we can start with you, uh, Dr. Tommaso, and then uh, I will. I would like to take each of your comment on this. Well, well th thank you, Fatih. I'll start, uh, and and I think that the answer is very short. Uh, um, we don't know, so we only have the registration studies uh, so far. So we don't know that the estrogen uh, is not uh, the same as, as estradiol, particularly because it does. Uh, uh, work in a different way in the liver. Uh, it seems to be less liver active uh, as compared to estradiol or other estrogens. So I would expect uh, that it would be different, uh, uh, significantly different in terms of metabolic impact. Uh, if it's better or worse, uh, I don't think we have the data to answer the, your question yet. So we will see. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elena, would you like to comment on this? Yes, and I pretty much agree with Professor Simoncini considering the fact that from cardiovascular aspect, unfortunately, estetrol has not been extensively studied, so in order to draw any conclusions with regards to the benefit or the harm. Thank you. Uh, Panagiotis, Dr. Yes, Panagiotis, I, would you like I to comment? Yes, I, I, totally, I totally agree. I don't have uh, in mind any comparative study uh, with regard to the effect of uh, this medication, of, of this formulation on a lipid or a glucose metabolism. So we need more studies for, uh, on that in order to, to answer. Thank you. Uh, there is another uh, good question. Uh, again, I would like to uh, take all your comment on this question. The question is, is there experience with starting hormone treatment in perimenopause? Uh, would you like to start, Tommaso, about this? I think uh, they want to mean uh, before before the end of the final uh, menstruation uh, around perimenopause. Is there any uh, use for starting HT? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, there's uh, a lot of women, uh, actually uh, a significant number, that start having vasomotor symptoms, particularly or sleep disturbances uh, before they get uh, uh, after the menopause in, in the years uh, just before menopause. And, uh, and a lot of women benefit uh, from uh, menopausal hormone therapy. The, now here, uh, one needs to adjust the therapy to the situation of the woman. For instance, adding a little bit of transdermal estrogens, uh, particularly with patches, but also gels are fine, which uh, 
provide a stable low level of estrogens uh, are very useful in, in women who do have cycles uh, in stabilizing mesomotor symptoms. Uh, on another side, if women have sleep disturbances, uh, use of uh, natural progesterone and menopause, which is very often useful also to uh, make uh, cycles more regular in this uh, challenging time of a woman's life can help because of the central uh, hypnotic effect of progesterone through its conversion to allopregnalone. So yes, it's feasible. And one needs to be able to um, eventually use something that is not as uh, uh, pre uh, prepared or uh, standard uh, as uh, it can be done in uh, after the menopause. Thank you very much. Dr. Elena, would you like to comment on this? Yes, and if we try to reconsider the fact that the changes, the studies have shown that changes in subclinical atherosclerosis and intima media thickness do happen more sharply around the time of the menopause, or the perimenopause actually, and particularly the late perimenopause, uh, even though I cannot recall of any single study assessing purely perimenopausal women, usually the assessment happens in studies that include peri together with postmenopausal women. I cannot see any risk from starting HRT provided the actual indication persists at this time. So if it is indicated, then yes, of course, hormone replacement therapy can safely be started in the perimenopause. Thank you very much. Dr. Parakitios, would yes, you I, like to comment thank, on that? Thank you. Thank you very much. I totally agree with uh, my uh, colleagues. Uh, we have experience, although we, there are no uh, robust data with regards to uh, strong uh, events such as fractures or uh, uh, cardiovascular disease protection, but uh, we should consider that uh, many symptoms that are regarded as uh, uh, depressive symptoms or sleep disorders or uh, 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 mood fluctuations uh, should be taken uh, under consideration especially if there are, uh, although uh, mostly uh, subtle differences in uh, menstruation, uh, this should be kept under consideration and we, we can prescribe taking the, the pros and the cons of uh, menopausal hormone therapy. This will alleviate uh, most of these symptoms and provide a, most, uh, a more stable uh, level of, of estrogen, uh, as well as uh, with a, a more uh, controlled uh, menstruation. So, of course, uh, there are uh, more benefits than harms in, uh, in this uh, sub subgroup. Of course, uh, we need more robust data uh, with regard to cardiovascular disease uh, uh, protection and uh, reduction in uh, fractures, which are the main uh, outcomes of HRT, as well as the uh, harms if, if there are okay, in, in this uh, subpopulation. Thank you all. Now, I would like to leave the panel to Dr. Maria and uh, Anastasia, uh, would you like to comment or ask questions? Let's start with Dr. Maria, here you are. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Maria Christou and I'm an endocrinologist from the University Hospital of Iran in Greece. I'm very excited uh, to be joining this very interesting uh, roundtable today. Actually, I had one question for each speaker. Uh, so, Professor Simoncini, thanks for this great presentation. Uh, given the pleiotropic positive effects of uh, menopausal hormone treatment on glucose and insulin metabolism, would you consider inserting therapy in a diabetic women without menopausal symptoms? How do you believe? There you go. Now I think you can listen to me, right? Um, so uh, thank you. This is an intriguing question. So um, in my opinion, the leading indication of uh, MHT should uh, still be uh, menopausal symptoms. Uh, and menopausal symptoms, of course, uh, has a, can, can, can be defined differently, okay? Protection of bone uh, is certainly something that falls within this category. But if there's really no reason why providing MHT, um, I, I think it's difficult uh, to think uh, about providing a long-term treatment to a woman uh, uh, because she is diabetic and because we know that MHT might improve a little bit uh, um, uh, diabetes control. I think we have so many good uh, uh, treatments for diabetes. Uh, I don't think that's really needed. 
Uh, on the other side, uh, so one thing that needs to be explained to our fellow um, colleagues, uh, the diabetologists or the internal medicine physicians, uh, is that if a woman has symptoms and she's diabetic, uh, they very often are skeptical about uh, on on in terms of. Uh, uh, thinking about menopausal hormone therapy because they think that uh, peripheral vascular disease in particular could be a risk. Now, here I think that uh, Dr. Armeni should step in uh, in, in commenting on uh, uh, what I believe is uh, right. So these women can have an advantage and should be treated, but they need to be assessed in terms of uh, uh, cardiovascular, pre-existing cardiovascular disease, some clinical cardiovascular disease in order not to make them at risk. Okay, okay. Thank, uh, thank you a lot. Dr. Maria, if you don't mind, I would like to give uh, one question right to Anastasia and I will turn back to you again. Of course. Uh, Dr. Okay. Anastasia, would you have a question or uh, comment on this? Dear presenters, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. They are really interesting and informative. Uh, so my question is the following. Which are the guidelines concerning the prescription of hormone replacement therapy in women with myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries? Is there any difference in the prescription in these women uh, compared to women with obstructive coronary arteries? Thank you. Is the question for me? Perhaps, yes, for doctor. Closer uh, to mine, yes. So, uh, long story short, there is no firm guidelines yet, but the very recent evidence has indicated that cardiovascular risk assessment takes a lot of factors into account. It's not only having obstructive coronary artery disease versus non-obstructive coronary artery disease. It's the smoking, it's the body mass index, it's the lifestyle and the nutrition of the woman that have to be taken all together into account. Of course, also the lipid level before deciding as to whether or not the treatment is indicated. For me, as an endocrinologist, I would be really hesitant to start the treatment on somebody with known well-documented coronary artery disease, especially if we discuss about a plaque that is not stable. But I would consult the cardiologist to that on an individual basis and also use the SCORE algorithm, as Dr. Anagnostic previously mentioned, in order to provide a European level of cardiovascular risk classification before deciding pro or against hormone replacement therapy if the woman has actually all the indications for it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Maria, I think you did have a second question. Please yes. uh, take, your, take your turn. I have one question for Dr. Anagnostis and one for uh, Dr. Armeni. So, Dr. Anagnostis, thank you so much for this uh, very informative presentation. Uh, LPA is not always uh, part of the standard lipid profile in all centers. Uh, what is its value in uh, dyslipidemia management and screening of postmenopausal women? Yes, thank you very much for your, for your question. Uh, L. Britley uh, has emerged, has the, not recently actually, but it has been uh, recently endorsed in the, in the guidelines. Uh, uh, actually, it is recommended uh, that at least once uh, in a person uh, lifetime, uh, we, we should measure uh, L. Britley because about 20% uh, of the population uh, may have increased the L. Britley. For, I, for some uh, researchers, for some clinicians, uh, it has been supported that uh, uh, high LPLA is above 50, either considered above 30. Uh, in any case, uh, we have no actually uh, medications. Uh, currently, we have no med medications that uh, decrease LPLA and have uh, proven uh, efficacy with regard to uh, cardiovascular risk reduction. There are some uh, medications uh, in phase two uh, trials, uh, as far as uh, I can remember. Uh, that um, uh, 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 attack the APOA uh, gene, uh, the kind of, of uh, gene therapy, and um, uh, actually targets the uh, oxidized uh, phospho phospholipides of uh, uh, LPLT lane. So we need more data with regard to cardiovascular risk. What is recommended? First of all, if a patient has high uh, LPLT lane levels, 
and uh, uh, LDL cholesterol uh, above targets, we can prescribe a statin. This is suggested, not recommended, suggested by the uh, guidelines to decrease the, the LDL cholesterol level so as to offer kind of cardiovascular protection. Uh, we must keep in mind that the statins may slightly increase uh, LP delay. With regard to hormonal therapy, we have uh, estrogen and tibolone. We must not uh, uh, show the, we must not give the, the message to the, to the uh, clinicians that uh, if uh, everybody has uh, LP delay increased, they should take estrogen. No, uh, if uh, uh, a woman needs estrogen for her vasomotor symptoms, and of course, if she's uh, uh, in, uh, in the subpopulation of uh, premature ovarian surfaces and needs estrogen, uh, we should take LPD delay into consideration because we may see a decrease in about 20 to 25%. This is more beneficial if we take uh, uh, into, into consideration the uh, whole uh, lipid profile because Tybolone may also decrease LPD delay, but it may also decrease HDL, the good cholesterol. We must uh, uh, tell that to the, uh, to the, to the patient. So uh, LPD delay should be taken under consideration. Uh, the main message is to consider the uh, patient's individualized uh, cardiovascular risk. And if uh, the woman has uh, uh, the uh, indication for menopausal hormone therapy and high LP delay, we may select uh, oral, uh, progest uh, oral, oral estrogen. And uh, of course, if we also give a transdermal, LP may decrease to a lesser extent. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anagnosis, for uh, this, uh, for this answer. Um, I have one last question for Dr. Armeni. Uh, so, you, if, if you yes? don't mind, maybe Anastasia may have another question. Do you have of another course. question, uh, Dr. Anastasia? Uh, my second question is uh, the following. Is there any difference concerning the impact on, glu on glucose homeostasis among the different types of estrogen regimens? Perhaps it's for Professor Simoncini. Thank you. So the question, thank you. Thank you for the question, Anastasia, is uh, whether there's any difference in terms of uh, glucose homeostasis between the different estrogen regimens. So conjugated equine estrogens, estradiol, doses, uh, routes of administration. Yes. The answer is certainly yes. Um, the first evidence, uh, and I hinted to that also during my presentation, is route of administration. So anything that is provided orally, uh, influences uh, glucose homeostasis much more than any, than any estrogen that is provided transdermally. Um, now, the uh, difference in, uh, between uh, estradiol, ethinyl estradiol, which is not used in MHC, but of course it's uh, uh, is also an, an, an interesting comparator in terms of glucose homeostasis and conjugated equine estrogen, which is a big mix of estrogen. Now, comparator studies are really missing, so there's not that much uh, um, evidence. Uh, and um, most of the studies that compare different concepts uh, also include the progestin. So it's difficult to um, uh, speculate uh, on uh, what is done by the progestin and what is done by the different type of estrogens. Uh, so overall, I think the most solid data is on route of administration and on dose. So the, m m the higher the dose, uh, the most uh, uh, relevant is the influence on glucose, uh, on lipids, uh, on coagulations, on, and, and all these are uh, liver targets. Uh, so this needs to be taken in mind. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Maria, uh, you can have your question. Thank you, Professor. So, Dr. Armen, thank you for the excellent presentation. My question to you is on the timing hypothesis. Uh, up to how many years after the menopause would you consider initiating HRT? Uh, is there a time limit for its observed cardiovascular effect? So with regards to the duration of starting HRT, as per the guidelines, up until 60 years of age or 10 years after the menopause is considered more safe. But there is no action, there are no studies available with regards to a time limit that would be associated with perhaps myocardial infarction as, or in comparison with uh, cardiovascular mortality. It's all pretty much because cardiometabolic risk factors are many. It's not only the structural changes of the cardiovascular system that are going to reflect an adverse or positive effect of HRT. So we need to take everything into consideration evaluate the woman as an individual, not 
holistically as a cardiovascular system and that is how we can make a safe conclusion. Otherwise, up until 60 years of age and 10 years after the ovarian senescence is definitely safe. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. I am receiving messages that we have to stop over here. Uh, on the on the behalf of Imas, I would like to thank you all. Uh, we have discussed very important issues related with the woman health, and also I would like to thank the Abbott uh, uh, sponsoring this meeting for us. And uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much all again. Thanks. Now I am closing this session over here. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. For thank your you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.